This episode of Aquarium Hobbyist Podcast with Aqua Alex is brought to you by Aquaplenish, the first electronic water change system providing fish keepers with easier water changes. Check them out at www.aquaplenish.com for more info. You are listening to the Aquarium Hobbyist Podcast with Aqua Alex. On the Aquarium Hobbyist Podcast, any and everything tropical fish and aquarium will be discussed. From fresh water to salt water, cichlids to clownfish, Aqua Alex has you covered. What tropical fish topic is up for discussion today? Let's find out. Aqua Alex, take it away. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Aquarium Hobbyist Podcast. I'm your host, Aqua Alice Cardinelli, and I'm very excited because I have a special guest on our show today. We're going to have a wonderful guest on our show who loves giving speeches. This is going to be a show that I promise you as a fish keeper, you're going to enjoy this show very much. Our guest tonight is an aquatic technician at Aquarium Design Group, and he's the president of Greater Houston Aquarium Club. He is also known for giving speeches at many aquarium shows and events. He has a love and passion for tropical fish, and he's going to bring some excitement to Aquarium Hobbyist Podcast. It's been a little while since we've had a guest, and I figured that he would be a perfect guest for our show today. So, please give it up for fish keeper, Mr. Roy Williams. Welcome to the show, show, Roy. How are you today? Absolutely wonderful, Alex. Thank you, thank you for having me on the show. It's an honor and a privilege to have you here on the show, and thank you so much for accepting the invite. Anytime. So to get us started, I'd like to find out about you as a fish keeper. When and how did you get into the fish keeping hobby? Um, let's see. I think I was probably seven or eight. Oh, so 35, 36 years ago, um, I asked for an aquarium. My uh, cousin at the time had a couple of aquariums, and um, I asked for one for my birthday. And, yeah, I started with my first school, 10-gallon, and, yeah, within – Five years, I think I had almost 20, 25 tanks. So, yeah, that was really my start uh, quite a few years ago. Nice. So you started big with 25 aquariums. Uh, It was, you know, one at a time. Um, You know, uh, prior I, I had been done a lot of native collecting. Um, I was always in a ditch or a creek, you know, pulling fish and, you know, cataloging like invertebrates or um, reptiles, snakes, lizards, amphibians, you know. If it was slimy or crawly or came out of a ditch, I was I was all about it. <laughs> so if you remember, what was your very first fish tank? I, it had to have been a 10-gallon. Um, I remember having Tetras, but that's probably as good as I could get. Maybe glow lights. Um, I, it was a long, long time ago, um, and I've had so many fish since then. I couldn't honestly tell you what my first fish was. I remember it was a while before I actually picked up any cichlids, so... If that tells you anything, you know, it was, it had to have been Tetris. That's good to hear. So you started off with beginner fish, basically. Oh, yeah. I mean, really, I had a love for a lot of exotics, you know, but at the time, they were outside of my price range. You know, I was mowing lawns to get money for just little fish. Um, you know, as as I grew into the hobby, I found really my strong passion was, you know, naked back gymnotiforms from South America. So that was 
where I started diving into, you know, with brown ghosts and black ghosts and glass knives. And then I started going into centipede knives and mouse knives. And beyond that, really, it was hard to get any of the gym noted from South America at that time, at least for me. Oh, nice. So it sounds like in the future we could do a show on uh, the South American knives since you sound like you're very knowledgeable on them. Oh, I, I'd love to. They, honestly, you know, I I have evolved as a hobbyist over the years, and those fish species or that group that I naturally didn't find a passion for, I can find a passion for. You know, it it takes many years, but over the years, you know, those – Things that I go, I'm never going to have Danny O's. And then all of a sudden you find it, you know, that you've got this really cool fish and you find what really sparks it within you. And then all of a sudden it's, you know, uh, I'm not huge into killifish. fish. And then all of a sudden you find some stuff and you get passionate about it. You know, I, I can't think of a, a group of fish that I'm not really, that I haven't found something that that I can take away from. That's awesome to hear. So, personally speaking, what do you like best as a fish keeper? So, I think, you know, crafting this this idealistic world, um, we kind of imagine, we, we've got this idea, this utopian, perfect aquarium that, that is looks exactly like this stream and wherever, you know, that uh arguably is not what we probably have in our tank. It's much more well groomed and much clearer than wherever they came from. But uh I think, you know, it's this magical mixture of chemistry and light science and um bacterias and feeding and temp and care that's just a really unique hobby. I agree with you. I think the fish keeping hobby is one of the best hobbies in the world and it's a very popular hobby. Now more and more young people are getting involved in it and I think it's great. I definitely agree, and I mean, you know, pushing the boundaries of of arguably what even falls under the aegis of our hobby, Um, you know, from paludariums to um, cold water tanks to planted tanks, both high and low tech, to reef tanks, to cold reef tanks. You know, there's such a wide diversity of things within the hobby that it's just, there's a lot to it. I agree 100% with you. So what kind of uh, tropical fish are you keeping now? Um, Let's see. I think that me and the wife have 14, 15 aquariums at the house, so... Um, we go from a South American Tapajos, uh, biotope to kind of a large freshwater puffer, low-tech planted. Um, we've got a couple of reefs and a large amount of small shrimp and nano fish tanks. Nice, so you have quite a selection. So in your uh, Tapajos tank, do you have any geophagus redheads? I do. We actually started off with six, and, oh, it, they've slowly kind of dwindled down in number, but I've kept them. It was a friend that had had originally started that colony, and um, they've done fairly well. It's just I think that they're kind of hitting that old age point. You know, we got them at an old at a, an older age, and you know have continued them along. But I've been enjoying kind of crafting and adding to that tank 
Um, you know, we, I have, uh, you know, some Sinatholamus, uh, we've got some nice, um, red spotted copienas, um, some driftwood cats, a handful of banjos, a couple of nice lorisards. Um, Sounds like an awesome tank. Yeah, you know, uh, I've been working on a school of uh, red tail heniotis. They're just a little bit persnickety. Oh, nice. Those those are beautiful. They remind me of a smaller version of a flat tail proxelotus. Oh, definitely. And honestly, for a schooling fish, they're just terrific. You know, especially for like a mid a mid sized tank. I couldn't get away with like some rummy nose. Tetras in there, the geos would probably snack them up. So you need something a little bit beefier, and they tend to school fairly well. Um, it's it's in a big, nice one ten tall, so it gives me a lot of room there. That's true. So, what are your favorite fish? Really, I mean, it's across the board. I I find fish that I love across the world, um, whether it is checkerboard dichrosis from South America to neat oddball pike kerosens from Africa to awesome royal trout danios beruleus out of northern India to amazing ornate rainbows out of Australia. I can find something in any lo- any area that I just can fall in love with. Nice. So you have a nice selection of uh, favorite fish. You're just like me. You have more than one favorite fish. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've definitely got my, my, my loves, uh, in certain areas, but yeah, I, you know, uh, it just depends on, on what kind of tank and what kind of feeling. I don't know, I, I also tend to love big, mean, ugly, uh, brown fish, you know, I, I know that, uh, me and the wife always laugh. <laughs> if I, if I head out and, and get what I wanted at a store, it's usually some mean, ugly brown thing that can't tolerate any tank mates. <laughs> like dove eyes and stuff like that. Uh, you know, even a lot of like uh, goodies. I I have this really strong love for a lot of the Native American, like Central American goodies. You know, they um, the Mexican government really doesn't have the capabilities to ensure and safeguard those species, so they oftentimes get overlooked and they're disappearing at an alarming rate and really we're the only people that can kind of safeguard them so we really promote keeping those types of fish a lot just one tank you know if you've got 15 tanks a lot one to a fish that you might make the difference whether that fish survives to the next century or not Very good point there. So I know that you work as an aquatic technician at Aquarium Design Group. So what is an aquatic technician? In other words, what do you do at Aquarium Design Group? Um, so Aquarium Design Group was uh, a business out of Houston uh, formed by Jeff and Mike Sensky, the two brothers. Um, they're internationally renowned aquascapers. They lead our American aquascaping team. Um, They are connected with a lot of the movers and shakers in the aquascaping community across the world and are highly regarded. Um, We are lucky to have them here in Houston, and um, I got on board as an aquatic technician Arguably, my strong suit is definitely in freshwater, especially freshwater biotope, uh, kind of difficult freshwater um, aquariums. 
but uh, I can really handle salt, grease, whatever. As far as my job, I am a maintenance technician, so usually I I work with a client and kind of determine where, what direction they want in an aquarium, and I kind of guide them and assist them in choosing species that will achieve the effects that they want. Um, then I work on, as far as, like, maintenance uh the fish health, diagnosing illnesses, treating tanks, filtration. Pretty much I, I care for the aquarium, you know, and I just kind of guide them on feeding and on on proper care of husbandry of the fish. A lot of our clients, this is their initial first tank, and some of them can range from 200 gallons to 800 to over 1,200 gallons. And that's a very big tank for an initial hobbyist to understand water changes and chemistry and how to handle that. And basically, that's what we do every day. Um, you know, we hand, end up handling four to eight aquariums a day and just keeping them clean and looking top-notch. Oh, nice. So, it sounds like you deal with some uh, huge tanks. Do they have a lot of monster fish in them, or does they vary? It just depends. You know, uh, honestly... One of my big loves in a very big tank is going with small fish and going with a huge school. Very rarely do you see a school of four to 500 cardinal tetras, and seeing their behaviors in schools that large is just fascinating. We do have a few monster fish tanks, you know, with arowanas or, you know, large datnoids. We've got a datnoid out in the field that I think is pushing about 25 years. And uh, it's impressive to see them at that size. But this is, again, in a 3,500-gallon display tank, so... Very large. Oh, sorry. Um, Yes, yeah, uh, aquascaping, you know, generally we kind of help guide the client and talk about what types of wood, rock, substrate, and uh, softscape that really you can utilize for to achieve the best result. No. Um, yeah, I, I, let's see. Many of our accounts would be, you know, um, more of a traditional aquarium where they're more keen on, like, you know, the bright cichlids of Malawi, or they want sort of a traditional geophagus angelfish aquarium with a handful of larger tetras to kind of provide that Amazonian look. But occasionally we, we get some challenging aquariums. Uh, one that I worked on today is a 700 gallon. The gentleman grew up in West Africa and he actually kind of pursued, uh, he ended up moving away at probably around 10. And when he came to, the, to our shop and started talking with, with us about his vision, his idea was was remembering those fish as a as a child. So literally, we set him up a 700 gallon West African biotope that probably rivals any zoo in this country. Oh, nice! That's incredible. Sounds like you have one hell of an awesome job. It is a fun job. I I honestly can tell you that. I've worked many a job. This is definitely not – this is so much better. It, it's so fulfilling to actually do what you're passionate about and to speak with, you know, the clients. And really, they feed off of your passion. They, they can see it. And, you know, kind of expressing that is – it's a very rewarding job. It sounds like it sounds like it's a job that I'd love to have. <laughs> Hey, I'm, 
next time that you're in Houston, swing by. We'd love to see you, meet you, and I'll show you around. That sounds great. I'd love to come by and see the faculty and all the wonderful fish and fish tanks you have. But that's basically, you know, we we kind of, we do have a small retail element. Most of our fish tend to be kind of rare things that we are hunting down either for clients or for our store. We generally don't stock a whole lot of bread and butter stuff, so, you know, you're more likely to, to find endangered West African riverine and odd rainbow fish and to, you know, driftwood catfish. There's just a little for everybody. That's great to hear. I love the rare and exotic tropical fish because they have interesting traits and stuff. Indeed. Indeed. So I know you're also president of the Greater Houston Aquarium Club. So what do you do as president for the Greater Houston Aquarium Club? Well, I work with um, our four officers. Um, We've been around, we'll be going on our 12th year. Um, We're the only fish club in Houston that meets monthly, and all of our meetings are free. Um, We try to inform and educate the our our city and arguably anybody that's on our group um, because we always try to videotape our meetings and post them so that way everyone can actually experience the meeting whether or not you're there or not. Um, We also just promote good husbandry practices. Um, We've got about 4,000 members on our online group and we want it to be a positive place where people are not looked down upon or or ridiculed over certain tank ideas. There there can be a bit of snobbery in a lot of some in some of the groups. And we, we try to honestly, you know, address it and address our hobby with a scientific approach that it is achievable to do almost anything, depending on the level of commitment that you're willing to give. And researching and teaching others how to properly research is an important step that I think oftentimes people are not aware how to properly do. I agree 100% with you on that, and if I lived in Houston, I'd definitely join that club because it sounds like a wonderful aquarium club. Well, honestly, anyone is welcome to join. You don't have to be from Houston. We have international members from all across the planet. Um, They honestly love our club just because of the information we have our own personal generated information. I try to do an oddball fish and actually kind of walk people through where that fish comes from and where it's found and then kind of discuss what makes it so unique. And I do that every Monday. And oftentimes it gets shared across the planet. That's awesome. So... What are some things for fish keepers to do as a member of Houston Aquarium Club? Like, for example, do you guys do, like, fish store trips or aquarium visits? Um, Generally speaking, we have once-a-month meetings. They're always at our sponsor stores. Um, Our sponsor stores promote the hobby. They they support us. They give all of our members discounts. Um, Our club is free of charge. It costs nothing. Joining the Facebook is the entire cost of the club. Um, We, let's see, we have monthly meetings. Usually they're two to three months in advance so that everyone knows the topic, but we jump around topics from wild bettas to non-cichlids of Lake Tanganyika to uh, rainbow fish and other atherinids um, to water chemistry to filtration to 
We'll kind of cover all sorts of different topics. And honestly, we've been doing them for a good little while. We have covered almost everything. Um, once a year, we do a wild collection trip. Um, I think this is the sixth year. Uh, we just went to Galveston and collected out in Galveston Island State Park, um, both on the ocean side and the bay side. And uh, we've gone freshwater collecting all over Houston. It's really interesting to see such a big metropolitan area, yet finding small aquarium fish that people recognize. I couldn't tell you how many silk and mollies we pulled out last year. There had to have been, oh, uh, two, three hundred of them. And people were just amazed. We, I had a gentleman that is actually in Oslo, Norway, that collected a huge, a spring Texas biotope, and he has it currently set up in Oslo, Norway. Nice. So you've got fish keepers from everywhere. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, we also have a fairly active Breeders' Award point. Uh, Breeders Award Program in which uh, we classify different fish on difficulty and you can kind of develop uh, breeding status and you collect points. Um, we try to do a heavy focus on endangered or CITES listed fish so that we can pass them out. Oftentimes whenever you submit, you submit small amounts of fry. And those actually get auctioned. That's kind of what pays for the club. And um, it gets rare fish that need homes into younger aquarist hands that they might not have been able to ever afford to get that fish. That's awesome. So right now we're going to go ahead and take a short intermission. During this intermission, we're going to hear some show announcements for Aquarium Hobbyist Podcast. Coming up next is the fun part of the show. Roy is going to give us a lecture on a couple of wonderful topics, and I promise you're going to love these lectures because they're very unorthodox, but they're also very uh, interesting. So stay tuned. We'll be back with more right after this. On Friday, August 3rd, 2018, join Aqua Alex as he proudly celebrates his first year on Buzzsprout. It's time to slam the Aquarium Hobby on August 3rd as Aqua Slam makes its yearly debut in its inaugural debut. On this show, there's going to be special guests, wonderful fish topics, music, entertainment, and much more. African cichlid guru Donovan Barger kicks off the show to talk about African cichlids in Frontosa. Our main event guest is Sam Garcia Jr., who's going to talk about Central American cichlids, monster fish, and crown roaches. Our topics include indoor DIY goldfish ponds, to the United States of America, best fish keeping YouTube channel, thoughts on hybrid fish, and much more. Plus, music, entertainment, and more. So be sure to join Aquaslam on Friday, August 3rd, 2018, right here on Aquarium Hobbyist Podcast. Wednesday, August 15th, 2018, is going to be a historic day for yours truly, Aqua Alex. I will be turning 25 on August 15th. To celebrate my 25th birthday, I'm going to be doing a very special episode. I'm going to have a few special guests on the show to talk about tropical fish, and I'm going to talk about my favorite tropical fish. So join me on August 15th to celebrate my 25th birthday. Fish keepers, are you ready? Saturday, August 25th, 2018 is our next Fish Keepers Open Forum Q&A with Aqua Alice. Do you have a tropical fish question? Do you have a freshwater fish question or a saltwater fish question? Wait, a 
answers them all. Submit your questions to Alex Goyegi for Noe19 at gmail.com. You can submit a text question or a spoken audio question. Again, send your questions to Alex Goyegi for Noe19 at gmail.com. If you're going to submit a spoken audio question, use the voice recorder on your smartphone, tablet, or computer. Record your questions in your name and send them to Alex Yankee Scardelli, 19 at gmail.com. I look forward to answering your tropical fish questions on Saturday, August 25th, 2018. Aquaplenish provides Aquarius with a whole new point of view on water changes. Make your aquarium water changes easier with an Aquaplenish electronic water changer. The innovative Aquaplenish water changer pre-treats water, monitors temperature, and replenishes your aquarium water with a push of a button. It also provides a power boost to your siphon gravel vacuum. 100% pre-treat, monitor, and replenish your aquarium with the push of a button. Pre-treated water provides the best quality water to replenish aquariums. The Aquaplenish Water Changer is the first retail product that provides an easy solution to pre-treat new aquarium water. For more information, visit www.aquaplenish.com. Purchase one at a special discounted price. Get $20 off an Aquaplenish electronic water change system by using the discount code AquaAlex2018. Aquaplenish.com. Go get your Today. We're back here on Aquarium Hobbyist Podcast, and today we have a wonderful special guest, the knowledgeable fish keeper, Roy Williams, and now we're going to get into the fun part of the show, and Roy is known for giving lectures and speeches in the aquarium hobby. Now, off microphone, you have told me what your favorite lectures are, so I'm going to give you the floor to discuss them here if you don't mind. Hey, by all means, honestly, I can probably talk about whatever, but you, you shoot me some topics, and I'll, I'll give you what I know. I know earlier on the show you mentioned the non-cyclid link king and eacon biotopes and the wild beta biotopes, so I'll have you start with those two. All right, so I think that, that oftentimes when we approach the rift lakes, um, I see a lot of hobbyists approach the Rift Lakes. They oftentimes will choose Malawi, Tanganyika, Victoria, or even one of the otter ones like Natron. Um, they, they focus solely on the cichlids and are unaware of just the plethora of hobby fish that we see regularly that are found within those lakes and that hail from those lakes or even what's a, what can be found if one goes hunting. Lake Tanganyika is probably the most diverse, but I think that Lake Malawi is a good second. Um, inside of Lake Tanganyika, you have a lamp eye species. A, the Tanganyika and killifish is just an outrageously beautiful fish. Um, Dystocotus and some of the tetras are some that, that most people are not expecting to see. You know, you look at like a Lusosa or a Sexfasiatus, um, even something like a Bullinger Featherfin tetra is amazing. And in a large Tanganyikan display can just be jaw-dropping, because people are not expecting to see a huge school of tetras in that in that tank. They're expecting to see cyprochromus, they're expecting to see frontosas, not expecting to see tetras. Um, oftentimes we utilize um, lorisards in the tank to clean up algae. That's just our go-to. But there's a plethora of gara species, large garas, that are found natively within the lake and would achieve the same result. Now, you're going to 
have to watch for its aggression, but the purple labio is just a gorgeous species um, that I think would should be noted. The harlequin labio is another that, that really is an, a nice fish that would fit a bit more biotopically with that lake. Um, there, the large puffer, the mabu, is found within the lake. The ornate bicker is found within Lake Tan- Tanganyika. Um, there are so many barbs and saprinids that it's just crazy. And we're finally, initially, way back in the hobby, we we saw a few of them, but we're finally starting to see that secondary renaissance of a lot of the African barbs coming back into the hobby. And they might be a little pricey, but they'd be well worth the time and the effort. The amount of synodontis within Lake Tanganyika is just daunting. I mean, choosing one or two would be a terrific addition. And they can really be the crown jewel. If you were to get a granulosis, one of the white seam synodonts, I mean, it really remakes what you imagine that you know about synodontis. Even if you're familiar with a lot of the petrocolas or the multifo- uh, multipunctatus in the lake that we're more accustomed to seeing. Um, the masses and bellids are just fascinating. And we see more and more of those every year. Um, really, they are, they can set off a tank. And arguably, even some of the non-vertebrate species, such as the tiny-neaking crabs, they can be a little bit aggressive towards anything on the bottom, and they can clear almost six inches, um, along with some of the macrobranchiums. The mori is a shrimp that's found from there, and I've actually seen that on a few lists. Um, they are a little pricey, but imagining a Tanganyikan shrimp tank is just a cool thought. Really, Tanganyika has such a wide diversity of fish that to limit ourselves simply just to cichlids seems a travesty. Hopefully that made sense. It made a lot of sense, and I agree with you. There's a lot of species from Africa that are definitely intriguing, and one of them that you mentioned, uh, one of my personal favorite fish, the Oronite Biker, or however you want to pronounce it, the Oronite Polypterus, they're beautiful, and there's a, a wide variety of Polypterus species from Africa as well. Indeed. I, I think that they're a terrific species. I I. Choosing the correct tank mates with them it can be a challenge, but they are a really neat fish. And really, Tanganyika, we are beginning to grasp a lot more of the speciation that occurs within the lake, especially in regards to cichlids. But I think that there's a huge amount of ground to still cover. I mean, you look at something like our uh, Alpha Lampologus species, Sumbu. Uh, the Sumbu Dwarf, and arguably we we suspect that that is going to be a third or a fourth species within the Alpha Lampologine tribe. Um, you look at even the Frontosa, back in 2000 we had one species, and now we are at two and possibly a third. There's a good chance that Cyphotilapia species north, the Burundi group, is a third species to front. I love frontos. They're one of my favorite Africans. Oh, they're definitely the big gentle giants. I love when they get older, they're gorgeous. 
Oh, yeah. And I mean, you know, the, between Tropius, Petrochroma, you know, the Petros, you've got focus tanks with feather fins, you've got shell dwellers, you've got a rock dweller tank, you've got a kind of shallow water, a ret modus, or like goby tank. Um, and you even get into some of the Congo riverine species where you've got Lamprologemes that have fallen out of Tanganyika and evolved to adapt to the Congo River Basin. And seeing how how those fish evolved and why they're different than the lake-dwelling species that we're used to is just absolutely amazing. The only blind cichlid is actually a Lamprologeme that's from the deep areas of the Congo River. Nice, that's interesting to hear. So, uh, um, go ahead. I was gonna, I was gonna ask you too, we'd like to talk about the wild beta biotope. Yeah, so, bettas is a huge group. Um, oftentimes when, you know, individuals are new to the hobby, they're much more familiar with their ornamental bettas. You know, what well, we see at Petco and PetSmart and our big box stores, and they come in a little cup, and they're magical creatures that are brightly colored and long-finned, and they look awesome. And they are. Don't get me wrong. But bettas are a group that is disappearing very fast. Um, currently, I think that we're at 90 something species with possibly up to 120 um, that we're kind of in the works for. Um, many of them are disappearing very, very rapidly with a lot of the strip farming and palm oil plantations. They're just shredding the forest. And these little fish that eke out their way in a tiny little creek get demolished. Um, so I think conservation and focusing on understanding the betta and how it became what we're used to. Um, the, the, the bettas are really grouped into kind of tribes or whatever, or however you want to, to, to group them. They have different groupings. And the different species share, share certain similarities and breeding behaviors and are oftentimes share ecological niches and evolutionary patterns. Um, we're used to bettas that are bubble nesters, but there are bettas that are mouth brooders. Like everything was in that group. You know, the Unimaculata group, you know, the, from the gladiators to the macrostomas. Those are all mouth brooding species. Um, to some of the smaller casina groups, um, they're, they're just a wide, diverse group. Most of the bettas are found in really soft water, ridiculously soft water, very low pH. And it's we oftentimes want to transfer them and go, how do they adapt to my pH? And they don't. They they do very poorly. So usually achieving that 3 to 4 pH can be difficult for a lot of hobbyists unless they understand the water chemistry that is needed to approach that. Um, a lot of – a lot of individuals imagine that our nitrogen cycle continues to function, and it – it changes. And knowing those changes and anticipating those changes can be really important in succeeding with a low pH tank. Um, below a 6, bacteria no longer really function effectively. 
So there is no nitrogen cycle. You see no nitrites. You see no nitrates. They are not there. They do not exist. They only exist prior to that point, and then it's held in stasis. They don't go anywhere. So um, with a lower pH setting, your, your ammonia, toxic ammonia, is based upon pH, and it's based on temperature. There's big, huge charts that I can show you online, but if you look up ammonia toxicity, you'll usually find them. Um, the higher the pH, the more of your ammonia is considered toxic ammonia. There's a, a ratio that actually corresponds to whatever, whatever water you have. So you can just list off your amount of ammonia that you're getting on an ammonia test kit. Ammonia test kits don't differentiate between toxic ammonia and ammonium, which is the non-toxic form. And the higher the pH is, the more that all of that ammonia is harmful ammonia, not ammonium. The lower the pH is, the more it is ammonium, so it actually is not the toxic form. Below a 6, that's all that you see is ammonium. Plants can take it up, and you treat ammonium just as you would nitrates, and you basically water change based on ammonium as opposed to nitrate readings. It's just a different kind of approach to the hobby, and if you're not aware of that and you drop your your pH of your tank down to a 4, all of a sudden you, you start getting a ridiculous ammonia reading and you go, oh, my God, and you start pouring in um, distilled water or RO water to kind of do a water change. Remember that as you're pouring that water in, that that water is a pH 7, right, because pure water is – pH 7. It hasn't been acidified yet. So if you were doing a water change and you're dumping in 7, then you're actually toxifying the harmless ammonia that's in the tank, and it can actually cause it to crash. So when approaching a wild better tank, it's important to know your water chemistry. Know it really well and think through all your decisions. Hopefully that makes sense. That was some wonderful information on wild bettas. I learned a lot about them. Honestly, they're a delightful fish, very akin to killifish, but... If you're looking for something that can be a real gem inside of a small tank, if you only have a 10-gallon in your house, you know, going out and hunting down a nice pair of Smeragna or whatever, whatever, you know, uh, some Cocinas, it can be a really delightful fish. And know that breeding those fish and keeping and perpetuating them is a real challenge. I mean, it's a challenge for an advanced hobbyist. And by doing that and passing that on, passing that information on to younger hobbyists and sharing those fry and getting a population of macrostomas in Houston, should those fish ever disappear, we still have them. We've got a little arc of macrostomas, and we're accomplished at breeding them. They won't disappear off the planet. That's very true. So we had a great show. So you did a great job, Roy. Well, thank you. I, I, I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate what you do. I know it's a... Uh, it is a, a challenge to kind of get everything together and make this happen. And sharing it with the world, that's, that's an amazing job, Alex. I appreciate it. 
Thank you. We salute you. Have you on uh, once a month if, if you're able to do that? Hey, well, you know, um, I tell you what, if you, we can catch our schedules and make make a match, I am all happy for that. Awesome. I think you'd be a, a great regular guest, and I'm sure my listeners would appreciate having you on. Oh, yeah, and honestly, you know, if uh, anybody would like to hear about whatever, just, uh, you know, shoot Alex a message and give him a nice list of stuff to, to ask me about. Awesome. Sounds great. So I want to thank you so much for being here tonight, and I'll, I'll definitely have you on again in a couple of weeks. All right, that sounds great, Alex. You have a terrific afternoon, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with y'all. You're welcome, and uh, thank you so much for being here. All right, thank you, Alex. You're welcome. And I want to thank all the listeners for tuning into the show. I hope you enjoyed our interview with Mr. Roy Williams, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. Enjoy the Aquarium Hobby, and until the next episode, thank you for listening to the Aquarium Hobbyist Podcast. You have been listening to Aqua Alex on the Aquarium Hobbyist Podcast. Come swimming back to the next episode for more tropical fish chat and information on keeping your fish happy and healthy. Check out Aqua Alex on the following social media platforms. Facebook under the name Alex Cardinelli. Twitter at Alex Cardinelli 1. YouTube channel Exotic Monster Fish Keeper 1993. And Instagram, The Real Alex Cardinelli.